Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news analysis and commentary about Wichita and Kansas government and public policy. We broadcast on KGPT Channel 26.1, also its companion website, kgpt26.com. Some of you may know me for my blog, that's the Voice for Liberty at wichitaliberty.org. There the motto is Individual Liberty, Limited Government, and Free Markets in Wichita and Kansas. I cover things that may not be covered by other news media in Wichita and Kansas, or if we do cover the same news, I'll cover it from the perspective of economic freedom, limited government, and individual liberty because these are the things that are important. These are also the things we find so often under attack by our government, be it at the federal, state, or local level. So, please visit wichitaliberty.org. You can subscribe to the email newsletter I send two or three times a week. You can like the Voice for Liberty on Facebook. Follow me, Bob Weeks, on Facebook. And if you'd like to contact me, it's bob.weeks at gmail.com. Well, this week at Wichita City Council, there was an incident that should drive home the awareness of some of the problems we have in Wichita. Now, in some ways, I'm hesitant to tell you about this because much of it involves Mayor Coral Brewer. He won't be mayor past April because he cannot run again for mayor because of term limits. But he may want to be involved in public life in some other way. And at least one current council member wants to be mayor, and he has a lot of the same problems as does the mayor. Also, the problems I want to tell you about are really systemic at City Hall, affecting other council members and bureaucrats, as well as our city's civic establishment. Now, what happened this week is that the developers of the proposed apartments on the west bank of the Arkansas River in downtown Wichita asked for and received a revision to the project. And after George Lamb, he's one of the partners, after he presented the project, Mayor Brewer asked that his partners join him at the podium. The mayor praised Lamb for presenting outdoor concerts at Bradley Fair for people, the mayor said, who can't afford to attend concerts at Interest Bank Arena, Century 2, or Hartman Arena. Then he added that while attending these concerts, they could also shop. Now, I don't know if you've been to Bradley Fair. It occupies the southeast corner of 21st Street and Rock Road. It is probably Wichita's most exclusive retail center. Now, it has a few stores like Pier 1 Imports and Barnes & Noble that might be found anywhere in town, but most of Bradley's Fair shops are expensive and high-end. Now, inconsistent and confusing observations like this from our mayor are humorous and probably don't harm anything or anyone. Well, anything but Wichita's reputation, that is. But for the mayor to deliver the praise that he did to these three men reveals something that is very harmful, and that's what I want to explain. Now, first of all, George Lamb has created many developments in Wichita, and as far as I can tell, these investments have been made with little or no government involvement. And hopefully he has profited from these activities, because we know that profit earned in free markets is a sign that value has been created. Customers wanted what was produced, and they bought it without being forced to. Everyone is better off then. It is the other two parties that we need to be concerned with. These two men are Dave Wells of Key Construction and Dave Burke of Marketplace Properties. These two men and their relationship with Wichita City Hall illustrates the need for campaign finance reform in Wichita. I'm going to list some incidents of cronyism in Wichita. While I run through this list, I'd like you to keep in mind that Mayor Brewer and the present council members have no problem with incidents like these. So consider these recent actions by the council and its members. Well, the council voted to give a movie theater operator a no interest and low interest loan, and that was after the theater already received the benefit of tax income and financing. A minister dabbling in real estate development made a large contribution to his council representative 
just before he asked the city council for tax increment financing. And when that development was failing, the city granted a bailout. The council also voted to give a construction company a no-bid contract for a parking garage. When later put out for competitive bid, the same company won the contract, but with a bid 21% less costly to taxpayers. Executives of a Michigan construction company made contributions to the campaign of a city council member just before and after the council voted to give the company and its local partner a huge construction contract. And when a group of frequent campaign contributors wanted to win a contest for the right to build an apartment project, the city's reference checking process was a sham. City and other government officials were listed as references without their knowledge or consent, and none of the people listed as references were actually contacted. Then, a frequent campaign contributor, according to the Wichita Eagle, represented himself as an agent of the city, without the city's knowledge or consent, to cut his taxes on publicly owned property he leases in the Old Town Cinema Plaza. And city officials expressed varying degrees of displeasure, but it wasn't long before Dave Burke was back receiving taxpayer subsidy again from the council. And the council voted to grant $703,000 in sales tax forgiveness to frequent campaign contributors and the mayor's fishing buddy. And finally, Wichita's mayor sells his barbecue sauce at movie theaters owned by a campaign contributor who also receives city taxpayer subsidies. Now, what is the common thread running through these incidents? Well, council members voted to enrich their significant campaign contributors at the expense of taxpayers. And for many of these incidents, another common thread is the identity of the players, which are the two men that the mayor praised at the city council meeting this week. Each of these are examples of the pay-to-play environment that has been created at Wichita City Hall. And this is harmful to our city in a number of ways. First of all, overpriced no-bid contracts and other giveaways to campaign contributors, that's not economic development. It's cronyism and it's wasteful. And second, citizens become cynical, and justifiably so, when they feel there is a group of insiders who get whatever they want from City Hall at the expense of taxpayers. You know, at one time, newspaper editorial pages crusaded against cronyism like this. But that's not the case in Wichita. Yes, the Wichita Eagle has reported on some of these issues, sometimes in depth, sometimes in passing, some have escaped notice entirely. And the editorial page of the newspaper sometimes takes notice, but is rarely critical of the council or mayor. And third, when it is apparent that a pay-to-play environment exists at Wichita City Hall, it creates a toxic and corrosive political and business environment. Companies are reluctant to expand into area, areas where they don't have confidence in the integrity of local government and the rule of law. Will I find my company bidding against a company that made a bigger campaign contribution than I did? If I don't make the right campaign contributions, will I get my zoning permits approved? Will my building permits be slow walked through the approval process? Will my projects face unwarranted and harsh inspections? Will my bids be subjected to microscopic scrutiny? And perhaps most important, will the Wichita City Council prop up a competitor to my company with economic development incentives that place my company at severe disadvantage? This is exactly what the city does when it gives free taxes to builders of speculative warehouses. That happened this week at City Council in a different item. What is really troubling is that the mayor and council members do not see how harmful these actions are. They do not believe they have done anything wrong. 
they are not able to think beyond stage one. That is, they are not able to see any further down the road than the immediate consequences of their actions. They do not concede the need for campaign finance reform in Wichita. But these actions of the Wichita City Council have shown that campaign finance reform is needed. And citizen groups are investigating how to accomplish this needed reform since the council has not shown interest in reforming itself. It continually amazes me to realize how naive people are. Not long ago, a person who is politically active wrote a letter that was published in the Wichita Eagle. It criticized the role of campaign contributions in federal elections, noting corporations do not spend money on politics because they are patriotic, Rather, the companies expect a financial return. And later, that same letter held this. Locally, I understand that elections for the Wichita City Council underwent ideal, nonpartisan campaign finance reform years ago, and that these limits are scrupulously practiced. Well, this writer is correct in a way. Our campaign contribution limits for city and school board offices are relatively small. What we find, however, is that the cronies, that is, the people who want something from City Hall, they stack contributions using family members and employees. Let's take a moment for a commercial message, and then I'll explain how this is done. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. We've been talking about the need for campaign finance reform in Wichita. Here's how a handful of cronies stack up campaign contributions high and tall. In 2012, council members James Clendenin and Levanta Williams were preparing to run again for their offices in spring of 2013. And except for $1.57 in unitemized contributions to Clendenin, two groups of related parties accounted for all contributions received by these two incumbents. Those associated with key construction gave a total of $7,000. Of that, Levana Williams received $4,000. $3,000 went to James Clendenin. And those associated with movie theater owner Bill Warren gave $5,000 all to Clendenin. Now, the casual observer would not know this by looking at campaign finance reports. That's because for city offices in Sedgwick County, the name of a company a contributor works for is not required. Their industry and occupation are required, but these really aren't of much help. And further, contribution reports are not filed electronically, so the information is not easy to analyze. Some reports are even submitted using handwriting and illegible handwriting at that. So it's not easy to analyze campaign contributions for Wichita City offices. It takes some work. You have to see a name and investigate who that person is. And when you do that, you might find that a man from Valley Center who lists his occupation and industry as manager and aviation subcontractor, well, he's in turn married to someone who lists her occupation and industry as director of marketing. You have to investigate to learn that she is an executive of Key Construction. Oh, Key Construction, do you remember that name? That's a company whose executive the mayor praised this week. But here's what I remember about key construction. I remember that in August 2011, the council voted to award key construction a no-bid contract to build the parking garage that is part of the Ambassador Hotel project, now known as Block One. The no-bid cost of the garage was to be $6 million, according to a letter of intent. But later, the city decided to place the contract for a competitive bid. Key Construction, the same company, won the bidding, but for a price of $1.3 million less. Now, I want to make sure you understand that. 
Carl Brewer, Levada Williams, James Clendenin, they were all willing to spend an extra $1.3 million of your tax money to award their benefactors through a no-bid contract. Now since then, reforms have been implemented to prevent this, but color me skeptical. Oh, and in the case of the mayor, he also voted for a no-bid contract for his fishing buddy, Dave Wells. You know, we do have a law in Wichita. It was passed in 2008, and Carl Brewer voted for it. In part, it reads, Council members shall refrain from making decisions involving business associates, customers, clients, friends, and competitors. Well, look at this picture of Carl Brewer and Dave Wells of Key Construction and these big fish. Does it look as though these two men are friends? But our former city attorney says that this law is merely advisory and there is nothing wrong with Carl Brewer voting to send an extra $1.3 million of tax money to his fishing buddy. Well, last year the council also voted to grant $703,000 in sales tax forgiveness to the frequent campaign contributor and the mayor's fishing buddy. That's Dave Wells again. How is that compatible with a city law that says, shall refrain from making decisions involving friends? Now I know that the city, of county said that, city attorney said that council members do not have to follow what the law seems to say in plain and clear language. Fortunately, that man has retired. Perhaps change will be forthcoming. But I don't think council members need a law to guide them in knowing what is right and wrong. Voting to give money to your friends is wrong. Children know that. Why don't the adults in Wichita City Hall know that too? Well, just one more example of the problems at Wichita City Hall. In February 2010, the Wichita Eagle reported this. It said, Downtown Wichita's leading developer, David Burke, represented himself as an agent of the city without the city's knowledge or consent to cut his taxes on publicly owned property he leases in the Old Town Cinema Plaza. Oh, that's according to court records in this city attorney. Now, this property was located in a tax increment financing or TIF district. In that type of district, the city borrowed money to pay for things that directly benefit the developers, in this case, Burke and his partners. Then there increased property taxes. Now these are taxes that they have to pay anyway. These taxes are used to repay the borrowed funds. In essence, a TIF district allows developers to benefit exclusively from their property taxes. For everyone else, their property taxes go to fund the city, county, school district, state, fire district, etc. But not so for property in a TIF district and not for Dave Berg. Because despite the advantage of being in a TIF district, he still thought he was paying too much taxes. And some city council members were not happy at that action. City manager Robert Layton said that anyone has the right to appeal their taxes, but he also told the Wichita Eagle that no doubt that defeats the purpose of a TIF district. But the year after that, Burke was again receiving subsidy from the Wichita City Council, making campaign contributions too, and now being praised by the mayor. I hope I've convinced you that we need campaign finance reform in Wichita. We need laws to prohibit Wichita City Council members from voting on or advocating for decisions that enrich their significant campaign contributors. A model law for Wichita is a charter provision of the city of Santa Ana in Orange County, California. And that states, a council member shall not participate in, nor use his or her official position to influence a decision of the city council, if it is reasonably foreseeable that the decision will have a material financial impact on a significant campaign contributor. Or simply in plain language, you can't vote to enrich your significant campaign contributors. We'd also need to add, as does the law in New Jersey, 
Provisions that contributions from a business owner's spouse and children will be deemed to be from the business itself. And this is because for Kansas municipal and school district elections, only personal contributions may be made. So additionally, the contributions of principals, partners, offices, and directors, and their spouses and children are considered to be from the business itself for the purposes of the law. These provisions would be important as many city council members in Wichita receive campaign contributions from business owners, family members, and, and employees as a way to skirt our relatively small contribution limits. Now, such campaign finance reform would not prohibit anyone from donating as much as they want to any candidate up to the current limits. The law would not prevent candidates from accepting campaign contributions from anyone. This reform, however, would remove the linkage between significant contributions and voting to give money to the contr contributor. This would be a big step forward for Wichita, its government, and its citizens. Now, I see three paths toward campaign finance reform. One would be to work for a law in the upcoming session of the Kansas legislature that starts in January. Such a law would be statewide in scope and could apply to city councils, county commissions, school districts, townships, and other elective bodies. A second path would be to use the municipal initiative process. Under this process, a group writes a proposed ordinance. Then it collects signatures on petitions. If a successful petition is verified, then the city council must either pass the ordinance or set an election to let the people vote whether the ordinance should become law. This is what a group of, in Wichita has done regarding marijuana laws. Wichita voters will see that in March or April at the elections then. But there is also a third path, and this is the path that we should insist on. And that is for the Wichita City Council to recognize the desirability of campaign finance reform and pass such an ordinance, a pay-to-play -to -play ordinance, on its own initiative. It could do this at any time. All it takes is the will of the city to enact reform. And if we take the affected parties at their word, this third path should face little resistance. That's because politicians who accept these campaign contributions say it does not affect their voting, and those who give the contributions say they don't do it to influence votes. And if politicians and contributors really mean what they say, well, there should be no opposition to such a law. But I don't think this will happen. Our current elected officials, starting with Mayor Carl Brewer, they don't think they've done anything wrong. The cronies who benefit from City Hall, well, they're not going to ask for reform. They like the benefits they received under the current system. And the bureaucrats who work for the council are very cautious in pressing reform. After all, they work for the city council. How does a City Hall bureaucrat tell the mayor and council that they've been acting in a corrupt manner? And as we've seen in the past few episodes of Wichita Liberty TV, the idea of concentrated benefits and dispersed choice means that the average voter has little incentive to get worked up over all this. And so it goes on and on. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. There's been a lot of talk in Wichita that we need to become more business friendly so that we can attract jobs. Well, the things that I've illustrated are what the city of Wichita does to make itself business friendly. But we need to become capitalism friendly. In Wichita, in Sedgwick County, and at the state level, well, we've made some progress at the state level, but none at the city level. Well, the defeat of the proposed sales tax did help. So to end the program this week, 
I'd like to show you two short video presentations by a personal hero of mine, Tom G. Palmer. He is Senior Fellow at Cato Institute and Executive Vice President at Atlas Network. In the first video, Palmer explains that capitalism is about respect for other people. People matter, he says, and you have obligations to other people to respect them. And we don't have much respect for the average citizen coming from Wichita City Hall. And in the second video, Palmer explains that when government has the power to redistribute goodies, it pays to become a friend of government. Cronyism pays. It's worth the investment in campaign contributions, meetings, and lobbyists in order to have government pick the pocket of your fellow man and give the proceeds to you. You know, that's what we call business friendly in Wichita. Perhaps it's a reason why we are not growing. Most complaints about capitalism really are about cronyism, and that is a feature of state interventionism. Turns out it's good to be a close friend to the president. You can get a $500 million loan guarantee like Solyndra did. That's cronyism, and it stinks, and people should be angry about that. That's different from free market capitalism based on a rule of law. If you look at free market capitalism, at its foundation is respect for other people. If you want something that someone else has, there are at least two ways to get it. One is go whack him in the head and take it from him. The other way is to offer an inducement, something that would cause the person to voluntarily exchange it. You'll pay money for it. You'll exchange services. Those are re based on respect for other people. So at the heart of free market capitalism is the idea that people matter that you have obligations to other people to respect them. That's very important and should not be taken for granted. Other systems, communism, fascism, all these other anti-capitalistic systems are based on the idea that people are means to the ends of other people rather than being ends in themselves. So that's the first point. Second, capitalism teaches you to be respectful to other people. There's a wonderful phrase that the English still use in little stores, you buy something and they say, thank you for your custom. That's what it means to be a customer. You get this double thank you experience. Think about it. You go into the store, you buy something, you say thank you, and the other person who sold it to you says thank you. There's a double thank you because it was an act of respect between two people, both of whom benefited from the exchange. Typically, when people complain about capitalism, what they have in mind is cronyism. Most of the complaints about unfairness, about the bankers and so on in Wall Street, they're complaining about the bailouts, the things that made the Tea Party members justifiably and legitimately very angry. We should be angry about that. But it's not free market capitalism that is responsible for bailing out firms that have done poorly, those firms should go through bankruptcy or should disappear. Uh, the cronyism is, in my opinion, the problem. And people should indeed be angry about that. But that's why the um, uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street protesters, I think, are misguided. They're not getting it. They're, they're profoundly, deeply confused. And cronyism is a feature of interventionism. When you have the power to redistribute goodies to other people, it pays to become your friend or to ter determine who has that power or to acquire that power for yourself. And that system breeds one intervention on top of another. So cronyism uh, is a feature of interventionism. For this audience, I don't think I need to explain in great detail that our economy has a substantial amount of cronyism. There's not only uh, positive sum games like an exchange, there's negative sum games of redistribution, but more common are, excuse me, zero sum games of redistribution, more common than we like to admit are negative sum games in which we're all made worse off because I'm picking your pocket as you're picking my pocket. And there are huge transactions costs in the process. And this last point here about diffused costs and concentrated benefits is something that I do try to explain to students and I usually hold up a packet of sugar as an example of that. Every time you buy a little bit of sugar, and I ask how many people here had sugar in the last six months, obviously all hands go up with the exception of a few diabetics, uh, you're enriching a crony system, sugar cronyism. 
We restrict importations of sugar to benefit small numbers of cane sugar growers in Louisiana and Florida, and larger numbers of people who make sugar in the least economically efficient and most dunderheaded way known, which is to grow beets in, uh, in the Midwest, because we don't allow inexpensive Brazilian and Caribbean uh, sugar to come into the country. Each one of us pays a tiny fraction of a cent every time we have a cup of coffee with some sugar in it. But you add that up, it's a lot of money. People will invest in lobbyists and campaign donations and one-on-one -on -one meetings in order to get access to it.